think with that, we'll get started then. There's a good amount of people here. So welcome everybody, uh, wherever you're joining from. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, and welcome to our webinar today on designing a cost-effective launch beyond LEO. Uh, we're joined by some pretty awesome panelists today. Um, and we'll be covering a range of questions and then transitioning into an audience Q&A at the end. So please be sure to send all your questions either in the Q&A function in Zoom or, um, or just in the chat, we'll see them all. I'm coming to you from Payload Space. For those of us who don't, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we are a media, a media for a media company in the space industry. We have a newsletter, a daily newsletter, which you might be, many of you might be signed up for. We do webinars. We have our weekly podcast. Uh, we also have a science newsletter and a brand new policy newsletter uh, that just launched this week. Um, and we would also really like to thank Spaceflight for sponsoring this webinar, uh, specifically Tony and uh, previously Jody and Kiko, who we worked with closely on all of this. So to jump into content, um, as many of you may know, launch costs have fallen dramatically over the past several years, uh, but much of the focus of current offerings is on reaching LEO. So launches beyond this, like Tegeo and Cislunar, are also ripe for this cost disruption as demand is set to grow. The use of orbital transfer vehicles, OTVs, and in-space transportation and services uh, are also key factors in achieving this vision. So today we'll be diving into the launch market beyond LEO and how infrastructure like OTVs can push costs down. And with that, uh, I think we can launch into some introductions, individual and company. Tony, would you like to get started? Sure. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to the Payload Space folks. Um, and thank you for the fellow panelists for, for joining today to, to talk a little bit more um, about these cislunar missions and, and what can be done to try to make them more accessible and easier to access for, for our customers. So, um, so yeah, uh, Tony Frigo with Spaceflight. Um, we are a company that offers launch um, and in-orbit services for our customers. Uh, most recently, uh, we launched our Sherpa LTC vehicle, which is a chemical uh, orbital transfer vehicle for one of our customers. Um, and we currently have another four orbital transfer vehicles on orbit. So um, very excited though, um, as we kind of develop our, our next generation uh, Sherpa vehicle, which is uh, Sherpa ES, um, short for escape, where we can access more of those markets to geo and the moon. So uh, that's a little bit about me and a little bit about spaceflight. From there, I guess I will turn it over to James. Thanks, Tony. Um, James Baltitude uh, with OrbitFab. Um, been with OrbitFab since the early days, uh, previously CTO. And, and these days I work with them on uh, a number of missions, trying to get missions to fly and, and with some other companies as well. Um, OrbitFab's mission is to build gas stations in space. And so we're effectively in space refueling infrastructure. Um, the reason that this beyond geo, these, these higher orbits are really exciting and interesting to us is that there's like clear market demand there for what we're doing. Uh, we've been working closely with Space Force uh, and we'll be delivering propellant uh, to Space Force, both as a commercial product um, and as equipment that they can then use to refuel their own systems uh, in 2025. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've, we've been looking a lot into different options on how we can get both those missions and long-term our supply chain to be built out in geo and in cis lunar space. Um, and yeah, there's, de there's definitely challenges there. Uh, at the same time, refueling, I think, helps to, to carve down a bunch of those challenges over time and is really complementary to these OTVs. So um, excited to, to chat some more here. Um, shall I bounce it over to Will? Sure. I'm Will Coogan. I'm with Firefly Aerospace. I've been at Firefly for a little over five years now. Uh, we uh, work on end-to-end -end space transportation. So that includes launch. We have an alpha launch vehicle that uh, achieved orbit last October. Uh, we also have a contract with Northrop Grumman for a, a medium launch vehicle that can uh, help get folks started on these, these uh, deeper space destinations. Uh, and then we have uh, a few different in-space products. We have a space utility vehicle, which is a, a type of OTV. And we have a Blue Ghost lander, as well as a Blue Ghost transfer vehicle, which are the, the products for which I'm the, I'm the chief engineer. Uh, for that Blue Ghost product line, we have uh, two different NASA contracts, as well as some commercial contracts uh, out to the moon. Uh, we were actually just awarded our, our second contract to go to the far side of the moon. 
a couple months ago. Uh, so the first mission is going to be the middle of next year for the, the lander, and the second one will be a little over a year after that. And then I will hand it over to Philip. Thanks, Will. <clears throat> Uh, thank you to Payload and to Spaceflight for uh, for sponsoring this. This is a great uh, discussion and an opportunity to chat about beyond beyond um, geo uh, deliveries and uh, at quantum space. Uh, we're really focused on infrastructure and services in geo and beyond. Um, we see a growing need for uh, for both space logistics as well as space data services um, in this domain. And uh, and as part of our business model, we are developing our Ranger vehicle, which is a a, a large orbital transfer vehicle um, in, in to, to fly on dedicated EELV class vehicles with a with a sole focus of, of uh, reducing the barrier to entry for customers that want to fly to, to geostationary orbit, to the moon or beyond. Uh, in addition, at, uh, at Quantum, we're focused on data sales and data services through our Scout vehicle, which is a small Espo Grande class vehicle um, that is edge computing enabled and capable of collecting lots of different uh, of data sources uh, to support space domain awareness, space traffic management, and other things in, in the, uh, the, the geo and lunar corridors. Um, I have a, a background in uh, launch vehicle design and um, spacecraft design, um, and uh, really excited to, to be here talking with you all today. Great. Thank you all. Now that we know what everyone does and uh, who they are. Let's dive into the actual discussion, which I, this is one I'm personally very excited about. So to start things off at the high level, um, what are the key ingredients and challenges to consider in these missions? And I'll hand it over to oh, two people unmuted at once. Let's go with James. Yeah, um, I think that there's, there's like two major challenges. Like, first of all, you have the technical challenges. Um, getting higher requires more delta V. Um, that's just, you know, the simple orbital mechanics. Um, but then you have the kind of like flow on challenge as a result of that, which is that these activities become more singular. Uh, and as they become more singular, they become more expensive and they become harder to coordinate. Uh, and so really it's, it's not necessarily the technical challenge. It's more the logistical challenge of how do we collect multiple clients together and get them to the right place at the right time to make them, make them meet all their missions. We've been able to kind of tackle that challenge really well in, in Leo. A lot of the people on this on this call with me have. Um, and I'd say that's the challenge that I see um, as a person trying to buy this capacity. Yeah, I, I think, James, I was going to probably touch on very similar themes. Uh, to put a finer point on it, you know, getting access to, to geo or system or launches is still very challenging. Um, we touched on it kind of at the beginning, but the low Earth market, um, has is getting to a point where it's commoditized. Um, there are uh, there's a lot of access there, whether it's from existing LVs in the marketplace and and even the new entrants um, will with with Firefly um, gaining more access to that low Earth orbit uh, market is is becoming easier and easier to do. But the geo market it's still really challenging. I, I do think that's where you know some of these OTVs or orbital service vehicles can can help in that regard. You know, taking what maybe isn't uh, maybe as a lunar mission, um, uh, one that Intuitive Machines is working on, um, and uh, with the with an orbital transfer vehicle, um, basically dropping a payload back off at geo uh, geosynchronous orbit. So I think that's a great way where OTVs can help uh, expand those launch opportunities, even though they're not launch vehicles themselves. They can expand the opportunities and, and hopefully bring some of those costs down for folks to get in the marketplace. Yeah, and I would just add to that, uh, Tony, that I think reliability and and um, recurring launch opportunities is so important to to this. This is something that that uh, happened in Leo, and and I think uh, launch re launch reliability, being able to launch in the time and the date you actually planned, has has actually become tangible and and really. Uh, really helpful, which means businesses can raise money and, and start to plan around those launches. And that's a that's a huge deal. We have to get there in geo and, and in the, in beyond as well. We have to get to the point where things are happening regularly, where customers can count on us, whether we're the, with an OTV or directly dropped off a launch vehicle to actually deploy them on the time frame that they that they want, especially in this unique uh, economy we're in right now. I can maybe just add some for the, the surface of the moon. Uh, obviously, that's been a challenge for a number of folks in recent years with, uh, I, I think, several uh, failures to, to soft land. Uh, and I think building a, 
you know, commercial interest in something where it's hard to guarantee 100% success, where you can't 100% test like you fly, and where there are unknowns on the surface waiting for you that you can't verify in advance. I think, you know, we're going to have to demonstrate a few successes to really help bolster the, the commercial uh, market for, for the surface of the moon. Uh, however, we do see a lot of interest there. So uh, after we demonstrate some successes, I'm, I'm pretty confident that market's going to, going to keep growing. And it's kind of self-sustaining as well, right? Like as, as you guys generate successes, both with lunar landers and OTVs, you also build out a suite of components and capabilities that can then go into the, the vehicles that the people like, like OrbitFab build, that again, then they go live in those orbits long-term. Um, so it's complementary, and we're looking forward to seeing this, this new activity. Yeah, I like to say we're all building Legos and together we have an amazing Lego kit. It's a great point that that uh, when it comes to space Legos, the actual uh, the actual components that are available uh, for for whether it's ourselves building our hardware or or customers that want to operate in these spaces that needs to catch up too. Uh, a lot of a lot of need for test beds and, a, and an ability to bring the the readiness levels up on on hardware as soon as possible, so that so that uh, customers can build with confidence. We can deploy them with confidence and and operate in these harsher environments for as long as possible. Yeah, that's another opportunity, right? For, for orbital transfer vehicles or orbital service service vehicles, right, Phil? Where you can have those, instead of a customer maybe having to spend you know tens of millions of dollars on a bus to test out a component or investing significantly down that development path, um, on any one of these earlier opportunities, they can get flight heritage on that uh, much sooner in the process and get the feedback much quicker. Ultimately, you guys are right. It's it's gonna be a process where you can't wait anymore for, for two to three years for a component to come off the line. Um, you're going to need to have a much shorter timeline to be able to deliver on those because that's just the way the market is headed at this point. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a really exciting time to see that that shift from you know the the more traditional folks who are looking to access these markets to folks who are uh, a little more new in that space. Um, so, it'll be very interesting to see how things trend. Great, so to zoom down now to the customer perspective, potentially, and we'll zoom back out, but for now, um, what types of payloads are demanding these services already? And what uh, what are you seeing are their mission requirements? I can go first on that one. Uh, so for lunar service missions, we, we're seeing NASA still our, our anchor tenant, although we are seeing more commercial interest. And most of the payloads that we're taking, we're taking 10, NASA sponsored payloads on our first mission, as well as a couple, uh, maybe three now, actually commercial payloads. Uh, and then we have uh, three payloads on, on our second mission already. Uh, they're, they're mostly science instruments or tech demonstration, uh, people looking to demonstrate, you know, sample gathering, institute resource utilization, and, and uh, to learn more about, about the moon and the, the environment around the moon. Yeah, from our perspective, as we've as we've brought Ranger to market, we've started to see, um, I would say, more of a an interest in geo to start for for orbital locations than cislunar space. But cislunar space is more nascent, especially in in the use of um, uh, Lagrange points for communications architectures and and uh, you know support stages for for missions like Fireflies. Um, we are seeing kind of a broad mix of customers anywhere from, you know, really small uh, CubeSats to, to pretty large. I mean, anywhere between uh, three and 700 kilograms that want to get to GEO. Um, that's part of why we designed Ranger to be so large is to take some of the larger complement of payloads that need to get to GEO um, from a dedicated opportunity and, and to really partner with um, OTVs, companies that are building OTVs that support um, some of the uh, the the ESPA class or smaller spacecraft that where we can go even further, and and I think that's really exciting because um, as all of these classes of spacecraft start to uh, start to be utilized in in geo, um, we need multi launch solutions to get them all to where they want to go. Yeah, and I I think the kind of similar to what Will and Phil said. Um, you know, what, what we're seeing here is uh, certainly a lot of the, uh, we touched on earlier, technology maturing companies, folks who have a product who they want to demo it, they want to try it out, um, they want to bring it to market. How, how do they do that, right? What's the access way for them to get a, 
a 20 or 30 kilogram payload to to geosynchronous orbit? How do they do that? Um, so we've we've seen a lot there. Um, and obviously, I'm sure James will touch on you know uh, in orbit servicing and, and refueling, which is which is also a really critical part um, of the future there. But that's that's certainly what what we're seeing um, is is more of those folks who are trying to break into this newer space, seeing that it's ripe for growth, um, but still having a challenge about how do they get there, uh, and when they get there, how do they operate their payload? Yeah, I, th I think it's interesting because Leo and Geo have really sorry not Leo and Geo, Geo and Cislunar Space have really similar challenges, but have fundamentally different kind of customer bases at the moment. Um, when we think about Geo, like six years ago, I looked with a, a big group of students at International Space University at how Geo remains relevant in the ComSat market. Um, and, you know, about six years ago, the, the major Geo ComSat providers were really scared because they weren't sure how their business cases were going to continue to stand up as we move from kind of like television broadcast to internet and um, you know the the types of services people want to change, things like Starlink coming online it was unclear if Geo would remain relevant. And in the last kind of six years, we've seen that Geo is definitely still a very relevant orbit, but for an evolving kind of like set of services. And so we're seeing services like Starlink and and Kuiper and those other internet services slotting in and providing good low latency internet. But we're seeing that there's reasons to use Geo as well, and it's becoming a very strategic orbit that's very important nationally. And so we're seeing renewed kind of national defensive needs for it, right? Like we have satellites out there like SIBAs that we we kind of all need to prevent um, really bad things from happening on the planet, right? And so the defense uh, industry, I think, is and and you know the U.S. Air Force and Space Force have really lent in on how can they better manage that place uh, and keep it keep it basically safe and and good to operate, uh, and that. We've seen at the same time and just an increase in the amount of activities along satellite servicing, which is intrinsically dual use. Just, just today we saw an announcement that uh, it looks like the Chinese space plane has been able to deploy a satellite and then go and capture it and, and restow it. Um, so these technologies that are servicing technologies, but can also be antagonistic technologies are progressing all over the world. And so it's been interesting to see that, that in geo, I've been seeing a huge amount of demand from defense um, in order to protect those assets that are both national and kind of provide international backplane to everyone. But we don't see that in CisLunar yet. In CisLunar, it kind of remains like a domain of NASA. Um, so yeah, at the moment for, for OrbitFab, primary customers there, defense, um, but also those commercial satellite operators and kind of the, the, the middleman operators, if you will, the life extension vehicles that are able to attach to an unprepared uh, ComSat and extend their life or potentially grab them, move them to a new orbit, and give them a lot of the flexibility in their operations that they were kind of demanding uh, as they got scared and in the past and looked at how the future will look. Yeah, James, I think that's a great a great point uh, in terms of another customer set who's going to need these sort of services, right? You spend you know tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on a on a launch and and put your payload into orbit and someone can sneak up on you and and cause damage to it, right? Um, you need to be able to have a way to to protect that very valuable asset up there. Um, and it's it's currently something that, again, we're kind of on the very leading edge of it right now about what that's gonna look like. But um, I'm sure we've all read the Space News articles as well about you know satellites tracking other satellites and coming in close formation of them, right? And we need to have some way to protect those assets up there. So the US government is gonna be a really important customer for these services here. Yeah, and I've heard that as well. And um... One of the things we've been we've been seeing at Quantum is is not just the requirements to to uh, help protect, but also to help reconstitute if something does happen. So so how do we how do we get assets back out there quickly for for our customers? Um, and quick really matters. I know I know Tony will agree with this with Sherpa, but quick is really um, it really sets your architecture apart. So you have to choose you know, the right thrusters, the right propulsion subsystems, the right avionics to actually get to and deploy payloads quickly. Um, and I hear that consistently from the customer base that we talk to is how fast after launch can you get us to this final, this final orbit or into this final thing. And it's not, it's not trivial in cislunar space, especially because it takes you time to navigate around to get into the right orbit states and, and deploy. Certainly the same thing if you're going to use the moon to come back to geo. So um, we continue to look at how do we, how do we do this fast? Bill, that's a, you reminded me of another sort of interesting concept that we've heard, which is kind of this deploy on demand, right? Mm. You've got payloads on board that are are kind of just hanging out, waiting for the right time for, 
for for a phone call and saying, hey, we just had an asset go down. We need another one that's basically on orbit right now. Deploy it. Um, and you could be up in a very short period of time um, while that launch infrastructure is still in work on replenishing that other asset. So I, I think that's another interesting concept that's come out of this idea, this you know, sort of responsive space and, and deploy on demand uh, is a very interesting thing that, that the market will probably grow into. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. So with a bit of discussion about customers and who wants to fly there, um, now let's shift the conversation a bit to who is flying uh, to Geo and Syslunar. What are the cadence of these launches and what does cost look like today? I, mean, I, I think I mentioned some of the customers that we're taking on our, our first two missions. Uh, the CLIPS program through NASA is awarding about two missions per year. Uh, so that's approximately the cadence. And uh, you know we're, we're going back to back years. And I, I think there's going to be enough commercial interest that we can continue going uh, at a rate of about once per year. Um, somebody mentioned that, uh, I think Philip maybe mentioned that there was a lot of interest mostly by NASA in Cislunar space. We have actually seen a lot of interest from the, the Space Force side of things in uh, looking past GEO. Uh, I think primarily concerned with folks going out past the moon and then coming back to GEO. Uh, most of our assets are right now looking in the Earth direction, but we need to, we need to be checking our back also. Yeah, we, we've seen that come through. Uh, part, part of the sensing fleet that we're putting up is specifically to, uh, to sense and, and detect resident space objects in cislunar space, but primarily to help protect the geostationary arc um, because, because of the kind of the orbital dynamics that go, in, go into that, there, there is increased interest in, in those domains. Um, we have the same thing. We, we see the need, uh, just like Will, to, to be on a regular metronome with our vehicles, to be around at least once or twice a year. Well, we don't think it needs to be metronome like in the in the once per month, once per week range like Leo is becoming, but but really providing reliable uh, services every every six to, to nine months that we think is a really huge um, discriminator and and motivator to them for the market to really think about um, how their how hardware can be used and operators can use their spacecraft in geo or in cislunar space. And so we figure once this is there, once all of us are flying and doing these missions, um, the, the market will will follow suit and start to use our capacity um, in unique ways. Yeah, I think um, I, I actually think, you know, kind of thinking about in the future, um, kind of getting back to the original question of, you know, what sort of what's the cadence of launches? It's there. There really aren't that many opportunities. It's still very challenging. Um, and and I think, Phil, you're exactly right in the scenario of, you know, being on some regular cadence. But. I can envision a scenario like we just talked about where we need something that's a quick access, right? And so I, I do think in the future, there will be those opportunities. It's, it's uh, you know, the uh, kind of the analog to, or the analogy is something along the lines of like cargo, right? You can cargo on the earth, right? If you, if you need to do something quick, maybe you choose a different service. Maybe you choose a smaller launch vehicle that can just launch your spacecraft to that right orbit. It might cost more money, and then you've got, uh, you know, these more sort of regular options that are are provided on a, a more infrequent basis, but it's much cheaper. And so it's one of the reasons why, you know, we designed our vehicle kind of the size that it is right now is it does uh, leverage kind of as much as we can the most sort of launch vehicle opportunities um, and put us in a position where we could fly on a lot of different those. It still would be great, you know, to fly on that large rocket, you know, once or twice a year because that's gonna offer us the most generous uh, pricing. But then there may be those opportunities where customers need something much sooner. So it's definitely a it, launch, I think is still uh, still a missing element here that needs to be improved on for the market to continue to grow. Right now it's it's choked at this point. I, I would like to, to speak to responsive launch uh, and, and support these, these fast turn missions, uh, just because we do have a Victus Knox uh, contract with the Space Force. That's actually going to require us to receive a payload and launch it within a, I think, a 60-hour window, uh, and that's coming up in the next, uh, I believe, month or month or two. Um, I'm I'm the least involved on the launch side of things, but I know that's something that the the space force has been extremely interested in. How how quickly can you take a payload, turn around, encapsulate it, you know, fill with fuel and everything, and then get it up into orbit where we want it to go? Yeah, that's something people don't talk about a lot when they think about um, responsive space and launches that payload processing is is not designed to be a 60 hour process. 
So that's, that's going to be fun to watch and see how you guys do that. Um, I think the, the procuring launch thing is interesting right now. Like when you ask who's flying right now, there's effectively like one vehicle, if you're a US company that you can go and buy from that's, that's going to drop you in an attractive geo orbit right now. And that's SpaceX. Um, Vulcan will be online soon, right? And so there's launches that are manifested and everything there. We haven't seen it perform yet. Um, so it's, it's interesting. We have this kind of bridge to the future that we have to build. And it's not just what can you get to geo or to cislunar space. It's how much spacecraft design do you have to do as a person that wants to build a spacecraft payload that's going to live there for 5, 10, 15 years. Because if you're carrying a circularization stage and designing and building that in-house as a small company, you know, that's significant engineering increase. And so these OTV companies, um, you know, all three of the companies on here really excite me as opportunities to, to take some of that away, standardize it, and really like increase the cadence that we can get these things there. Yeah, I was thinking about this to put a finer point on the on the discussion about pricing. Um, that's something I've noticed is as we go out to market with Ranger, uh, you know, we're probably we're still impacted by Leo launch pricing in these in these areas because there's a, a well well known sort of yeah five thousand a kilogram whatever the number is on a given day, and geo and access to geo and cislunar space is just not just not that as as James already mentions is th this is a lot of hardware and it's not just. It's not just Leo hardware either. It's not you know commercial off the shelf. It's it requires some pretty high radiation tolerance and and careful uh, build and and so putting all that together, I think there's going to be a, a some time that it takes the market and the gap to close a little bit between what we can offer, what the market wants to accept, and that's part of that's part of life. That's that's part of what we do here as as new entrants is we try to to find the right price point where we can keep moving forward and customers can get to orbit while it bootstraps. Uh, when while while we we really figure out what that that going rate is going to be for for geo or or cislunar deliveries, so I think there's some time there for for the gap to close. I'd, I'd provide what could be an unpopular opinion here, but uh, if you're trying to build a business that's in geo or cislunar space, I would say go out there, develop the business, develop the business model, and and price the launch at the price that it needs to be to make the business model close, um, because we're going to see fundamentally the price to get to geo decrease over the next five ten years, uh, and go out with that market demand. And then that's where VC exists to support, you know, the companies building the OTVs and the companies that are buying potentially the first one at a price they don't like. Um, but I think if you go out there and look at it as potentially lower, in general, everything in geo, potentially a lower cost, a higher cadence, um, there are some super exciting new business models that can come online. It'd be cool to see, uh, you know, entrepreneurs looking at them and, and trying to attack them. Yeah, that's a great point, James. And certainly, with the right amount of funding, if you want to affect that timeline, you can, right? Um, but yeah, I, I think, Phil, kind of to your point, I think some of what we're doing today is what we probably have to do on a daily basis, which is to try to educate our customers on, to your point, I, I know that there's this $5,000 per kilogram out there rate, but that is not what you're doing here. And oh, by the way, uh, you know, the thing that you've designed in Leo won't work in Geo, or it may for a very brief period of time. Um, and so it's just a, it's an interesting space to kind of be in right now and, and our jobs to, to try to educate folks on, on, you know, just the mechanics of what it's like to operate in this space. There's a lot of interest in it, but there aren't a whole lot of people who kind of know what that environment is like and how punishing it can be or how difficult it can be to get to. That's a great point. Even just trying to get geo capable electronics engineers um, and you don't want like the most gray beard that's going to go with exactly how it's been done. You need to find the person that's that with an open mind and willing to project forwards to a new way of doing things. Like we're in a talent war in general in space. And when we start looking at geo capable engineers, it's an even tighter pool and even harder. So we're going to have to do a lot of learning together, but this increased cadence could allow us to have a Leo like revolution where we learn how to fly new technology and make it work. Yeah. Right. And not necessarily intrinsically sacrificing the reliability of a component, but it, it does shift the dynamic, just like in low earth orbit, where if you're not spending tens of millions of dollars on this asset, you know, there is a chance that it doesn't need to be, you know, or if you can put a couple of them into orbit, doesn't necessarily need to be as reliable. And so it's kind of that weird uh, iterative loop uh, that you get into with design and reliability, if that cost component is changed. I just want to point out because it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, the, the environment for radiation at the moon is actually 
uh, surprisingly benign. It's it's more similar to to Leo, uh, if if anything. So there is a a distance beyond Geo at which you know kind of the Leo grade electronics become uh, more palatable again, especially with shorter duration missions like like landing on the lunar surface where you typically last only a couple of weeks. That's a really good point. Um, that's something that we've we've been looking at very closely as we design Ranger is. Uh, when you need to support both geo and cislunar environments, it's a lot easier to just say we're going to be a cislunar vehicle because then you don't have to worry about the geo environment and and things get a lot easier in what components you, you build. For an orbital transfer vehicle to be long lasting and support, you know, broad swaths of this of this large volume of space, you end up having to design to geo and then figure out a way to keep your costs down so that you can support cislunar missions where you don't actually need that much that, that much radiation tolerance. So it's a very interesting problem. We uh you know, we sort of we sort of make our lives very difficult on the on the integrator, you know, launch and and uh, transport side by having to cover three a, a size of space that's so 400,000 times bigger than Leo. So we're really really stretching ourselves <laughs> to do this right. Yeah. I do feel just kind of building on that. I, I do think it's kind of interesting to think about it from the standpoint of, you know, there is, the space is quite large and the requirements are very different depending on what it is you're trying to do. And so just kind of thinking about that, that cargo model and extrapolating it out. Um, and it, it could be that, you know, what Will designs for his lander um, is a very different thing than what is used to, to transport whatever it is that we're trying to transport back from the moon to Phil's, uh, you know, Ranger OTV, and then to get back from there to the Earth is another vehicle as well. And so that could be a way that, you know, right now, as you said, Phil, you could kind of design for that worst case scenario, or we could see the market tend to shift into more specialized vehicles, um, refueling, right? Uh, it could be that that's sort of its its own unique element designed specifically for that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see which way the market breaks out here um, to be able to accommodate those different needs uh, that the market is going to drive. And who even knows how things are going to shift in terms of policy regarding uh, disposal, end of life disposal. This is going to become a real interesting challenge for not just the spacecraft operators, but for all of us trying to do transport. Um, we're looking at it at both ways because we have vehicles for our data data layer that we need to think about end of life for um, to be compliant. And then Ranger itself. You know, what are we going to do with that? Certainly, you know, crashing vehicles into the moon isn't great. Vehicles going out into heliocentric space and they tend to come back. That's not great. Uh, bringing them back to Earth for reentry, also not great. So there's going to be a very interesting debate that starts to uh, uh, to build over the next, uh, you know, year or two as, as we send more and more customers and, and people in that area. There's also like the, the, the cost to move material, like to move aluminum and, and titanium up to geo is high. And once it's there, it remains effectively a raw material that could be a value. And so we should start looking at geo graveyard, not as a graveyard, but as a salvage yard. And then we have to start concentrating it. We have to start observing and understanding. We have to be able to go to the ITU and, and tell people that we're going to transfer assets between countries. Uh, massive amounts of change happen when we have unlimited maneuverability. And one of those things is that we can reuse these resources. So when you look at companies like uh, Cislunar Industries that want to effectively take, take space debris melt it down, provide a resource that can be fed into the 3D printing businesses, um, you know, phenomenally exciting new businesses and things like that coming online, going to be groundbreakingly, going to shake the whole industry from uh, legislation to, to technology. So it's going to be interesting in a couple of years for sure. All right. It seems our conversation has naturally drifted towards infrastructure. Um, so I'll just continue on that note. Um, so the next question is, um, once we are there, um, how are we building out this infrastructure at space? How are we offering services that we've already mentioned, such as fueling, maintenance, communications, SSA, and more? And also, how are we planning on, how is that going to plan on changing as costs change too? So, I mean, I'm biased here, obviously, but I believe that the fuel is the beginning of this, right? Maneuverability enables the rest of the infrastructure layer. Um, so the, the OTVs we're talking about here at the moment are kind of going to be making one-way trips. And once we have refueling in orbit for them, they can start making um, multiple trips, really changing all their paradigms and what they do. Uh, I personally think that infrastructure should be built at kind of like a geo plus 300. So the edge of the graveyard orbit. Um, one of the advantages of that is that you, you're drifting around the belt with respect to things in the belt. 
So if you have three, um, you know, kind of like super depots that look like this with like 6,000 kilograms of propellant in them, that's a pretty good robust infrastructure for a number of years. Uh, I think we're going to see propellants change over time based on what's available in orbit. Uh, at the moment, hydrazine is kind of the winning, the winning thing to go and buy. Uh, there's a lot of interest right now in um, kind of the, the laughing gas uh, plus hydrocarbon um, combinations. Uh, there was a good white paper. I mean, yeah, um, there's some, some, some good interest there. There's a lot of interest in high test peroxide, which is exciting from a, a lunar standpoint. Uh, I don't know who's going to win long term, but I, but I hope we converge on a single propellant. Um, and I think it will be a chemical propellant, personally, um, because chemical propellants are going to enable us to move things much quicker. And electric propulsion really wins on efficiency, which once you have infrastructure, efficiency becomes a, a second fiddle to, to using that infrastructure. Anyway, that's my yeah, the, I'm feeling rant. <laughs> the, the, the environment you expose your payloads to with electric propulsion in the geo region tends to be pretty severe as well. So you can get your you can get your customer to their destination. They just they just may be dead when they get there. That's right. Yeah. And so yeah, um, I I don't know exactly what the infrastructure looks like in cis lunar space. I will say, I know it will need to be there. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, for our second mission, we intentionally you know, we had two different architectures we could downselect between to to achieve the mission. One is a, a very large lander on the far side of the moon, but the other was to take a staged approach and. And we went with the latter because that gave us two spacecraft, one which goes down to the surface of the moon and one which remains on orbit. And because we're going to be on the far side, that one can then serve as our communications relay. Um, and then because it's kind of a copy paste of our lander, uh, we, we have an enormous amount of leftover fuel reserve, which uh, I think James was just explaining is, you know, it's kind of a key to, to many different things you can do. We have actually so much left over, we could, if we wanted, go on to, to reach Mars. We have that much leftover propellant. Uh, so we can stay in lunar orbit for five years, continue to be a common relay for future Firefly missions, for future other lander missions. Uh, we can be a transfer stage for, uh, you know, as one element of a sample return mission. Uh, we, we, can, we can achieve a number of uh, continuing missions with this, uh, this architecture that provides extra, extra resources in space. Yeah, I, I feel uh, similarly strongly about the staged approach. Um, you know, maybe in um, maybe not in uh, uh, in conflict with James's comments about refuel, but certainly in um, in connection is the need for uh, space situational awareness and space domain awareness within, especially the geo and geo graveyard uh, right now. That's that's a relatively uh, under surveyed area and in kind of the wild west, and it just gets worse as you go further out. So uh, we took the staged approach at Quantum to build these scout spacecraft that have the, all the sensors we need to, to really start to uh, understand the, um, uh, the, the cis lunar and geo environment uh, with space weather and optical and, and RF uh, payloads. And the staged approach for us was to deploy them with our Ranger vehicle so that Ranger would be left over to do other things. And, and Ranger has a chemical propulsion subsystem and enough on board that whether it's whether it uses all its propellant for maneuvers or has some left over, um, it has it has future lives available to it after the initial deployments are done. But we feel really strongly at Quantum that part of, part of the uh, critical infrastructure we need to develop is just simply situational awareness. We need to know where everybody and everything is. And right now we don't. And I say we broadly. I think different different parts of the world know different things about this these areas based on the vehicles they're flying. And we need to get to a point where we know it just a whole lot better. And so, so while you know, Orbit Fab and, and and others look at how to refuel, we're really focused on how do we build out the infrastructure for broad communications, broad situational awareness through what we call our, our quantum net uh, mesh of vehicles. Yeah, I think I would I would agree with all the panelists up here um, on on kind of the points they mentioned. Chemical uh, is certainly what we're pursuing in in that arena. Um, the other thing that I'll say is, you know, kind of the way that that we're approaching it, or and I think Phil, you might have been trying to get this get at this too, is to to really try to maximize that lifetime uh, of a vehicle as well. And you know, there's there's a lot of on any given vehicle right now, there's a lot of downtime, um, and and that ends up you know losing out on potential revenue sources. It means that those launch costs that the customer ends up feeling later on aren't spread as much out. And so what what we try to think about is similar to Phil's model there, where, you know, maybe there's customers who want to get dropped off in geo um, and they're discrete payloads. They've got a bus. 
then maybe what you have on board as well is you have some hosted payload customers who want to try out their own sort of tech dem demonstrator. Um, and then you've got a, a space, situ space situational awareness uh, payload on board as well um, for, for other needs there that you're using while you're not exercising those hosted payload opportunities. And that's what we've really been focusing on with our Sherpa vehicles to, to try to really maximize that, that lifetime of the vehicle and minimize the downtime so that we can bring those costs further down for, for our customers. So I think that'll be an important part as we think about, you know, certainly we hope for launch costs to come down, but, but while they aren't, and while they're not there quite yet, it'll be really important to focus on a way to really stretch those costs as much as possible so that we can get more customers into this market. Awesome. I think it is now time to jump into some uh, audience Q&A. We have a lot of good questions, so let's try to get through them, um, participants. Um, so the first question comes from Dylan from Palantir. Um, how common are supply chain or manufacturing disruptions given space missions typically have preset launch date with customer dependencies? Are space companies equipped well to deal with these disruptions? And I imagine the stakes would be even higher in our environments that we're discussing. Yeah, I can start just in our uh, in our development of, of the Ranger vehicle. Um, we're keeping a really careful eye to that because if we're all going to provide reliable and routine access, uh, it just all starts with supply chain. Uh, we've had to be relatively careful with who we choose for our suppliers and our partners. Um, we have to do some deep dives on 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 each of them to make sure that they can actually source what they need. Whether it's you know there's there are still chip issues and um, there are there are materials issues and things. Um, so we've just had to be really careful, and I think we'll have to continue to to deal with these supply chain challenges um, for the coming years. Um, it does seem like it's getting a little better on our end. And there's one thing I'll say is when you size your vehicle right, and you're able to use systems, whether it's you choose the right propellant that has lots of lots of available supply chain resources versus something that's maybe new and nascent, um, it, it gives you options. And so one, things I, one of the things I've realized is we really we want to have some competition on the supply chain side because it helps us keep our costs down. We don't want to have to sole source to a single provider all the time. Um, and in so doing, we can also really try to drive those, uh, um, those delivery dates down. Um, we have to be a little bit careful on our systems engineering, but but it, it is able to be done. I, I feel confident about that based on based on some of the work we've done uh, to get all our procurements on order for uh, uh, for Ranger today. Yeah, I think to add to to what Phil was saying there, it's something that we we certainly uh, take a look at you know pretty pretty closely when we're thinking about who we are procuring components from. Um, and uh, and I think it's it's really important as we think about you know our customers how the, again this space is different from the low earth orbit market right you know it's a scenario where every manufacturer could potentially have a delay so making sure that you have a good sparing plan is really important um so that if there is a delay you maybe have one of those other units in house because your next launch opportunity might be a year from now um and that's a problem compared to what you have with low earth orbit where maybe you can get another launch in a couple months there's just not that same opportunity in geo. So it's really important um, to be able to make sure that you don't let those disruptions cause, you know, a full year's worth of delay. Um, so being very careful and intentional about your sparing plan is important too. I would add here as well that like, as we see a movement from individual bespoke vehicles uh, and a couple of years between each launch to fleets, this gets easier for us. We have to buy more components, but we can buy a bunch up front, bear the risks that some of those will change um, and, and kind of lose some of these problems. Um, but at the moment, it remains a very human uh, human problem in human business. And you just need to, as everyone was saying, like work really closely with those suppliers, build relationships, be on the phone, understand what's going on and have your backups. Um, if you if you try to solve the problem purely in software or a spreadsheet, <laughs> it'll come and, come and bite you. You need to to stay on top of your supply chain really hard right now. And for Blue Ghost product line, we, we really did most of our vehicle design right in the midst of, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, so in, in terms of what we proposed versus what we made, we, we had planned to outsource a, a number of different components that we, you know, we tried to procure. The lead times kept going up and up and weren't going to meet our schedule anymore. And then ultimately we decided to bring those things in-house and, and control our own destiny. Um, for us, I think it helps that we have several different product lines. So um, 
you know, things that we make, like like our batteries, we make our own batteries now, we're able to use those almost identical batteries on our launch vehicle or on our SUV. Um, and then same story for, for core avionics, um, for composite structures, for our uh, aluminum sandwich panels. Uh, so everything we make, I think benefits every other program and, and vice versa, and really helps us control our destiny. Our next question is more about skill, skill discrepancies. So what are some of the differences between geocapable engineers and Leo capable engineers? Experience with radiation tolerance being one, are there any other significant engineering skill differences? I think that's a good question. It's, it's, it really comes down to experience, right? It's not necessarily, I mean, I think the same skill set applies. Um, it's what are the unknown unknowns and where is the institutional knowledge? Um, so with, with geo and with all electronics path selection and things like that, the, the lessons learned and those things are valuable. So bringing those, those people that have those lessons learned, know components, know these things, we still don't have like a unified network of parts we can go and look at and say, here's all the heritage of every part. Unfortunately, a lot of it's still controlled by individually by companies, by primes. Um, so it's the been there, done that, um, less than discrete skills and bridging that, that uh, knowledge. I think that's a great point. It's something that um, it comes with the territory of, of getting to a hard to reach orbit is that you, you don't, you can't really prove a lot of this stuff out in Leo and then take it and, and jump to geo. You know, we feel strongly that you really have to go all in on figuring out how to, how to fly in geo or, or fly in cislunar space, which cislunar space, there, there's some real specialties here. Uh, there's a three body problem the, that is hard. Uh, there are some real specialists in the world that you need to work with to make this happen and, and to build out that team. And so I, I wouldn't say that, uh, I mean, you know, high, highly capable, whether, whether young or, or really, really experienced, you know, we just need some specialists. There are some specialists that really help us along the way um, as we develop it. And the big thing is to fly is to get into, get into cislunar space, get to geo and operate and learn. And uh, that's, that's no small feat because it is hard to get there. Um, so that's that's a big deal. And I think, James, you're, you're right on point that where you can incorporate the experience of people who have been already flying vehicles in geo, it's really important. And I'd add to that uh, comms and thermal challenges. Uh, the further you get out, you know, 400,000 kilometers away, it's, it's a lot harder to talk back to Earth at, at an appreciable uh, data rate. And then thermally, I think even in geo, there are some extended eclipses, certainly on the surface of the moon. It's it's an impossible environment, <laughs> you know, through a lunar day at 100 degrees centigrade and then through the night at uh, minus, I think, 175 degrees centigrade. Uh, so it's, it's, there's some real challenges there that you don't see in Leo. Yeah, and thermal is like less well documented in all than, than mechanical, right? Like when we go and do mechanical structural design at this point in time, NASA has done a great job documenting the heck out of it. We, we know what good standards are. Thermal remains like follow the JPL best standards and stuff like that. And you're like, where are they? We'll go find some JPLs and talk to them. Uh, but we're getting there. Yeah, the further yeah. you go out, the more you want to do like onboard processing too. And that just further complicates thermal challenges because now you've got really hot computers next to things you might want to keep really cold, let's say in, in optic. And so it is, you're right, thermal is a, is a huge challenge. Um, then you throw a six or eight hour clips on top of it and, you know, in, in a Lagrange point, things get, you know, systems engineers get really angry, but they love it. Yeah. Comms, I was going to say the same thing. Comms, thermal orbit dynamics, uh, you know, whether it's multiple eclipses or the launch vehicle that you are flying with, you know, potentially having multiple launch days that are open to them. Um, and that's going to change the type of thermal profile you might experience or what sort of propulsive maneuvers you have to do. Um, so that kind of speaks to Phil's point about needing those specialists and, and really kind of trying to design those components for a lot of different scenarios. Um, but the environments are very punishing there. So we have two questions around risk tolerance, so I'll try to combine them. Um, so the, kind, the question comes down to, are customers more tolerant of failures and more lax with risk profile uh, due to the difficult environments? Um, and then also, how do you account for that higher risk profile within your business cases besides just hoping for the best? Uh, on the CLIPS program specifically, I think Thomas Zerbuchen said uh, said that it was all about shots on goal. And I think he said he'd be happy if one in two CLIPS missions succeeded, uh, one out of every two. Uh, we are aiming for 
you know, at Firefly, much higher percentage than that. Uh, but clearly, our, our our customer is is more risk tolerant than than you might expect NASA to be. You you got to go talk to your customer. Um, you've got to understand what they want. Uh, and the shots on goal point is a great point. Like when we look at small sat launch, um, obviously it doesn't happen first time every time there. It usually takes a few time goes to get there. We have a bunch of hard business models here. A lot of them might be harder than small sat launch. Uh, they're going to have technical challenges and require multiple goes at it. You have to build a business then that can deal with that. So you need to, from the start, price everything, understand it, be honest with VCs and everyone that that's going to take time to get there and then find the right customers in the government or commercially that are going to work with you there um, and keep proving it out. And we're seeing that with lunar landing. We've seen that with launch. There's no reason we can't see that with within space infrastructure. Yeah, I, I think James is right. R really getting your getting in front of the customer hearing what it is that their risk tolerance is. Um, and then, you know, for, for us as kind of manufacturers of some of these, you know, systems, it's about, you know, where do we find, where's the right balance in the customer base? Who wants what? Um, where is the market trending? I think it's, in, in my mind, when I think about these, uh, the, the type of customers that are trying to break into this market um, with the type of risk profile they may have, it's an interesting juxtaposition because Traditionally, with a new customer, they're willing to take on a little more risk, but because launch is so infrequent to this domain and because it's so expensive, you've got this, this kind of strange you know, inflection point where folks are trying to figure out, yeah, we're really eager to get there, but we can't risk losing our payload and, and you know, spending you know, tens of millions of dollars in that effort. And so it's, it's going to be an interesting uh, play to see how it shapes out. Um, with those customers and, and how they tailor their own risk profiles, how they accept what might or might not be available to them. But it really does come, uh, as James pointed out, to, to really talking to your customer and finding where that right pool is for your own business model and appealing to that group. I think what we've learned is that, you know, around $5,000 a kilogram or plus or minus, there, people will take risk, especially when vehicles you can build and fly using COTS components. And that, that's great. I feel like as we ratchet up the price, or, or more importantly, for, for us transport people trying to, to do this and, and uh, uh, make ends meet, the launch prices are high enough that it's in the realm of customers going, well, then, then you better be pretty risk averse. And we know what we should too, because we're paying all this money. And I think that goes back to, to a comment, um, Tony, you made initially uh, in, in this webinar, which is hosted payloads, I think, become much more valuable as an opportunity now then. So if you want to prove out, do a BIU or bring into use for some, some spectrum, or you want to prove out a system, but you don't want to take all the risk of, of a full spacecraft that needs to operate, I think hosted payloads are amazing for this because it kind of bridges the gap. We can be a little bit more nimble on, and agile on our pricing, and customers might be able to prove out some of their business models and help get to that next round of, of fundraise while gaining some experience in concert with one of, one of us uh, um, orbital transfer vehicle or, or bus providers. And so um, I even feel it as, as we do our own internal work to develop Ranger and Scout is that you start out saying, we're gonna be super, it's fine. It's class D mission or whatever you wanna call it. And then as time goes on and you see how much money you're paying to get everything ready, uh, and you gain momentum, you go, well, okay, I think I might actually want to be really risk averse. And so it's a real balance we have to strike um, to not be afraid because it is hard and you have to, you, you have to be pioneers here, but also to, to make sure you're doing the right, uh, the right thing with redundancy and, and reliability along the way. Yeah. Phil, not only does it, you know, in, in the hosted payload model, not only does it allow you to, you know, put some of that risk on the OTV, the OTV can be a higher risk profile there, but it, it can reduce your your costs that the customer may feel through risk in other ways. You know, their payload is lighter, so their overall launch is probably cheaper in that end. You don't need to necessarily have the same support services in-house that you maybe would have required. Um, and so you can kind of more closely focus on what it is that you're trying to do with your payload rather than trying to size reaction wheels or find avionics that can survive that radiation environment. So I think you're right. It is it is an area where I think, uh, especially for the for the right customer, the hosted payload option is a great one. Um, and I know that's one that we've been focused on at Spaceflight quite heavily. Uh, the other thing with that is that you can kind of break your big challenges up and match the risk of them to the vehicles that can get you there. So if I have an instrument that is really high risk that I need to prove out, I, 
I can put that on an OTV and prove it out. And then all of a sudden my instrument is higher risk than the OTV. Any price looks good, right? Uh, and that can save a lot of a lot of businesses that would otherwise die because they're they're not going to be able to afford to get it right the first time. I'm going to jump in. I think we'll have time probably for one to two more questions, but also thank you to the audience for like so, so many insightful questions. Uh, I think this might be a record of how many questions we got. Um, so the next question that kind of brings it back to market size. So everyone is focusing on Leo because that's where the market is. Um, how big is the market for Geo and Cislunar? So the, even the activity that is related to commercial companies is all government. Um, how do you market size the demand? So I think Leo is where the market is, but that's not where the market was, right? That that really is is fallout from the the COTS program that that reduced the cost of access to to the Leo region dramatically, uh, and I think for the the Eclipse program is going to be very similar to the COTS program. It's going to demonstrate accessibility of this of this region, and that's going to help generate a commercial market that isn't isn't even there yet. So while now the anchor tenants mostly government, I think it's it's rapidly transitioning to a commercial one. Well, and, and GEO is like the OG orbit, right? So it's, uh, I mean, it, it was used well before LEO was ever was ever uh, the way it is now. And so I think I look at it and, and think that the GEO market, while, while it is more uh, well-established companies operating there, is starting to, to see breakthroughs from, from smaller companies and, and disruptive uh, ventures. Uh, as James brought up, the use of the graveyard and, and operating in and around has, has benefits. Um, and and I think you know governments do drive a lot of innovation because they they provide non dilutive funding which helps get us bootstrapped. So since the since uh, certainly the U.S. government and allies and partners are interested in getting into geo into cislunar space to 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 do uh, their missions and and um, add more capabilities, I think it's a great signal that it's going to grow. And where where they put their money, we will tend to to try to help. And where we try to help and disrupt, we will help build markets for commercial customers as well. And so uh, I think the market's really big, especially in geo. And I think it's becoming bigger because of programs like Clips in Cislunar. And it's a, an extremely exciting time uh, to be to be supporting this area of launch. Yeah, this is the very, very beginning of the uh, of the Cislunar in the market, like, like so, so early. Uh, when you ask how big is the market, you have to think about the time horizons because we think of time horizons of 100 to 200 years. We could be talking about millions of people living and working in space, and, and we should be talking about that. Uh, and so that market is, is sized like a nation's market, right? Uh, and we're going to have all kinds of industry there, tourism, mining, refining of materials, refining of, of chemicals for use as propellants, as life support, those kinds of things. Uh, and that's going to allow us to move a bunch of stuff we don't want to do on the earth off of the earth, ultimately. So, uh, you know, that drives, it's it's hard to wrap your head around a little bit, but uh, I think the real question then becomes like, how do I put appropriate time scales to like, what is the market for the next five years? And I don't know how to do that perfectly. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you guys touched on it. I mean, we certainly are. Leo is where the market is right now, where where we're working on developing our vehicles is where we think the market's going to be in two to five to 10 years. Right. That's kind of the, the horizon we're doing here, because we have to design those products um, in advance to make sure that we're ready for when the market does uh, start to mature to that point. So I, I think that's definitely where we're headed. We see a lot of traction moving in that direction. It is just to kind of double down on James's point. It, it is it's a very exciting time to be in space and kind of be on these very early edge of where we think the market is going to grow. And, and for me, it's really cool to be part of shaping what that might look like. You know, you know, that 100 to 200 year, James, kind of blew my mind, but uh, it'll be it'll be very interesting to kind of see how things shake out. And I'm I'm pleased that I'm able to be part of it um, and kind of help shape where the market will grow eventually. I think it's really cool. Um, thank you all. That brings us to a little bit over time, but if anyone has anything they wanted to add, panelists, that you didn't get to say, now would be your time. Famous last words. All good. All right. Well, then, uh, yeah, thank you so much to the panelists and to the audience for asking great questions. I'm sure the audience will agree with me in saying this was a very insightful conversation for everyone. Um, thank you to Spaceflight for making this conversation possible. Um, 
Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you're not subscribed to Payload's newsletter, uh, you can do so at payloadspace.com, check us out. And definitely be sure to check out all the, all the awesome work these companies are doing too. And I hope you all have a great rest of your Thursday.